This is Behind the Headlines with behind-the-scenes analysis on issues affecting Pennsylvanians, sponsored by the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. Now, here's your host. Hi, from Philadelphia to Erie and from Pittsburgh to Scranton, it's Behind the Headlines. I'm Charlie Greenwald, Senior Fellow of the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy, and I'm joined as usual by my co-host, Mara Donnelly. Hi, Mara. Hello, Charlie. Why, we just had um, April Fool's Day pass. We did, yes. And uh, apparently there were some shenanigans going on in the Delaware Valley. Really? Uh, <laughs> and in Lower Pottsgrove Township. Lower Pottsgrove Township uh, issued a special alert. They said that there were UFO sightings uh, to try to uh, uh, kind of amuse their yeah. constituents. But in the Delaware Valley, in Upper Wakefield Township, police uh, let out, put out signs that said that uh, they were going to eliminate all speed limits. Uh, oh, <laughs> that's a good one. And people yeah. could drive at a um, unlimited uh, speed. Uh, and then they said, April Fools. Yeah. Uh, these are it's crazy. things I'm not used to seeing uh, in our local townships. Charlie, it, it's sad, but April Fool's Day is the only day every year that people critically look at news. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a sad statement. <laughs> well, to, to give us more information about those townships and many others, we have the best person in the state to do that, and that's Dave Sanko. Dave is the executive director of the Pennsylvania State Association of Township Supervisors. Welcome back to the show, Dave. Thanks. Appreciate being here. I can add another uh, another story. There was a township in the southeastern part of the state that uh, said, the, the, out of public concern for the kids' safety, and trick-or-treating in the dark, that they were moving trick-or-treating until uh, June 31st. <laughs> <laughs> Kids would have been all for that. Kids were for it. <laughs> yeah. Trick-or-treating in the daylight. That is a good story. You want Very to clever. You want Very to start clever. out? <laughs> well, let, let's start out. We're, we're really into the thick of uh, your time of year when you have your biggest conference. So why don't we start by telling us a little bit about uh, what's going on with your conference and how many people you expect and what okay. they're going to be learning while sure. they're there. Sure. Well, we've got, uh, there's uh, over 3,500 folks already registered uh, to be at the conference in Hershey, uh, where uh, they'll be, you know, getting, having an opportunity to see 300-plus uh, uh, exhibitors. We've got over 100 different workshops with topics from uh, land use to, uh, you know, GIS to uh, personnel practices and procedures, how to fix roads. Uh, it's really an opportunity for, for all those local officials to, to learn from each other and share best practices uh, to, so they can do their jobs better. Uh, and at the end of the day, that's kind of our job is to help give them the tools to do their job better uh, because they want to provo pro provide uh, affordable quality government at, uh, at an affordable price. It's probably really critical for new, newly elected township people, sure, right? Sure. I mean, we, I would think they would run to this event <laughs> I, I, I think I think they are uh, I, but I will say uh, obviously we're in a in a presidential election year now but uh, coming off of uh, a municipal election year uh, there were uh, literally uh, hundreds of, of folks who were newly elected uh, we just uh, concluded uh, 15 uh, 15 different locations of boot camps where we trained over 450 folks about uh, about 18 hours uh, over the course of a couple different weekends uh, all over the state, and uh, the learning all again all those kinds of things, and I think those folks are are excited about coming to Hershey. Uh, many of them, uh, many of them are. Well, how do you decide, Dave, which workshops to offer? Obviously, you don't offer the same workshop every year. How do, does uh, how do you and your association sure. um, figure out what would be the most useful? to the officials across the Commonwealth? Well, we go through a, an RFP process uh, where we'll solicit uh, uh, and get, you know, we got 150 different proposals in from folks uh, offering topics that may be of interest to, to township officials. Uh, we have a review committee uh, that goes through those. We clearly can't offer all of those. Some, some are combined. Uh, some are turned into webinars at other parts of the year. Uh, but uh, we try and do a, a broad range of, of topics, uh, some about public works, some about public safety, some about uh, general administration, uh, and some about uh, land use planning and zoning. So those are, are kind of the four big buckets that we kind of break it down into. And uh, with, with over 100 topics, there's, there's something for everyone, uh, whether your community is, is large or small. Uh, and, and it really it's, it's kind of highlights the best part about local government because 
everyone is different. Uh, each community can make their own decisions about what's important to them, what, what's needed in one, one area may not be uh, at all on the radar in another area. And we have topics to try and help them address that. Well, who are some of your uh, political VIPs that will be speaking to your group this year? So we are, we are anticipating and hopeful that the, the, governor, the governor will be there. Uh, we have uh, the Secretary of Transportation, Mike Carroll, uh, the, the uh, ex Acting Secretary of Environmental Protection, uh, Jess Shirley, and then we have uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, leaders from uh, the House and, uh, House and Senate. Uh, from uh, uh, the House, we'll have a uh, majority leader, uh, Matt Bradford. And uh, from the Senate, we're going to have Appropriations Chair uh, Scott Martin. And then we're going to have a, a legislative panel with local government uh, leaders and transportation officials on, uh, on Wednesday. So a couple, couple House members, a couple Senate members uh, from the majority, minority, a balanced, uh, balanced program. Wow. Well, since you're speaking about the legislature and the governor, uh, as they are preparing uh, to negotiate the budget in this time of year and uh, consider <clears throat> a whole host of new bills, what are the important issues that uh, your association is concerned with in the upcoming year, Dave? Well, I, th I think from a local government perspective, there's a couple, couple big things that are on the radar. Uh, one involves uh, just a for giving local communities the option to use uh, electronic advertising uh, to, to make their meeting notices uh, available. Currently, the law only allows that to be in print publications. Uh, print publications are, are going away in, in many communities. Uh, some communities don't don't even have a local newspapers anymore, uh, so we, we're looking for the option of being able to to do those notifications uh, electronically, uh, and that'll save uh, it'll save some money. I mean, Penn State does a survey every year. Uh, there there are thirty five million dollars spent annually just on meeting notices, oh, just goodness. for local governments, just in Pennsylvania. That's not that's not hiring. Uh, that's not procurements. That's not any biddings, that's only public meeting notices, $35 million. And we think there's a, a lot better ways to spend that money on behalf of the taxpayers. I know that you're, uh, one of your ongoing concerns is mandates, mandates coming down from state government, even some federal. Do, anything, do you have any new threats coming <laughs> your way or Interesting status you say that. quo? I, I, what's I going think, on? Uh, you know, scarily, yeah, I think there are new threats. I think, uh, you know, look, it's a, it's a presidential election year. All eyes are on Washington. A lot of people want to make things uh, done about the, the national and, and, you know, at the bigger levels of government and not at the local levels. And, uh, you know, there are some, some movements to, to try and, I mean, we've, we've kind of said, you know, leave the, leave the unfunded mandates off the table. Uh, give, us some, give us some tools. Uh, whether those are, uh, there's, there's talk about even having the state, uh, it's, we, we could call it preemption, where the state makes decisions for local governments and takes away their local choices. Uh, there is even talk about taking the, the land use decisions about where housing can be located, about where locations, anything can be located, uh, and put that at the, at the state level and having one rule for everywhere. So I don't know about you, but I'm not wild about some bureaucrat in, in Washington or Harrisburg, you know, drawing circles on a map and say, oh, I think they need a dollar store there, or I, I think they need uh, a housing apartment complex there, or I think they need a, an adult bookstore over there. Uh, those should be community decisions uh, and not, to, not picked by somebody out of town. Yeah, I would agree with that. <laughs> One of the other issues that we've talked about before, Dave, and has been, being, has been discussed in Harrisburg, uh, over the last 20 to 25 years is the issue of broadband access. Um, we know it's a priority for your association, uh, and there are lots of areas that still don't have um, access to, to broadband. Uh, have you um, been able to negotiate or talk to the Shapiro administration and make any progress on this. They declare themselves to be fully engaged in this. I guess I can ask you, how's, how's that issue going? Well, I, look, I don't think I've ever seen more money on the table uh, that is on the table right now between uh, Washington and, and Harrisburg with, with funding, probably mostly federal resources. But uh, it's about, uh, look, nobody, has a, nobody in Harrisburg has any problem spending money. <laughs> uh, it's a question about how can they spend it wisely and does it make sense. Uh, there are, as you indicate, uh, there are almost a million people in Pennsylvania who don't have a single ounce or drop of broadband access. Uh, and, and then the rest of the people don't have enough broadband access because mm -hmm. as we look around, more and more things are, are using broadband. It's not just your phone and your tablet and your computer. Now it's your thermostat and your doorbell and your mm -hmm. all these security other devices, system, security everything. systems. Yeah. So there's a, a huge uh, demand on broadband, and our concern is that that money ought to be spent first on the places that don't have anything 
uh, to give those kids an opportunity and those families an opportunity to have you know access to education and health care and jobs uh, before we go about building building out the network in more populated areas where it's more perhaps popular to spend there. Uh, and when you go into those communities that don't have it, I mean, like an example, uh, when you're defining how to go about doing it, uh, you have to go online to make an application. Mm -hmm. Well, my goodness, if you don't have broadband, how are you supposed how to make an application online? Yeah. And, and now they want you to get a, a, a municipality to be able to make an appeal for not having broadband is you have to, get, you have to go online and get a license from the FCC. Uh, which is, is it just kind of makes you scratch your head sometimes uh, when you're when you're trying to figure out these solutions and you know common sense seemed to have gotten lost at the door. I get it. There's a lot of federal rules and regulations go along with it, and, and if maybe we shouldn't have been expecting common sense to come out of federal the federal government and rules and regulations because that's, where, you went wrong. that's yeah. where we went wrong. <laughs> yeah. So I've been reading more and more about um, local governments dealing with cyber attacks, and that's it. Everyone's dealing with it, but it's frightening. Uh, what what are you guys doing about it to help your uh, townships face these? And do you think there's enough being done about it? I, I don't think there will ever be enough done about it. Uh, I think you know we, every day we'll do more than we did yesterday, and we'll always be better than yesterday, but never good enough to where we what we need to be tomorrow. Uh, but I mean, education is a big part of it, helping people understand the. The, the, the risk nature of it. Uh, a lot of people think, oh, local government won't be, won't be attacked because there's not any money there. Uh, and in reality, uh, I think the, the bad actors think they can attack local government because they think that nobody will attack them uh, mm -hmm. and they haven't put precautions in place. So a lot of what we're doing is about education mm -hmm. and trying to put those precautions in place and trying to help people understand some of the risks and the necessity of passwords, the necessity of multi-factor authentication. Uh, all the things that go along with uh, with needing broadband as well, but that and and we've also launched uh, uh, a, a, a partnered with a local uh, insurance broker to do uh, cyber uh, cybersecurity assessments uh, that don't cost the townships anything. Oh. Uh, that they can have an assessment. Here's here's what you need to do. You can choose to do it or not. You can decide what investments to make, what not. I mean, our job in, is never about trying to figure out how to tell people what to do, uh, and and that's what we we'd really like Harrisburg to adopt that approach and stop telling locals what to do and get out of their way and let them do their let them do their job. Just out of curiosity, is cybersecurity one of your workshops at uh, the uh, conference? There of with it of of the hundred different options, that is one of them, yes. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> okay. Well we wish you success at the yeah. uh, conference and uh, we look forward to you coming back uh, in the very near future and telling us what's going on on the hill and Sounds what uh, progress the budget's making, Dave. So hold on, and we'll be right back within, with the next segment of Behind the Headlines. Behind the Headlines is brought to you as a public service by the Pennsylvania State Association of Township Supervisors, the largest, most influential municipal association in the Commonwealth. Since 1921, PSATS has been preserving and strengthening township government and securing greater visibility and involvement for townships in the state and federal political arenas. Covering 95% of Pennsylvania's land mass, townships represent 5.5 million residents, more than any other type of political subdivision in Pennsylvania. Additional underwriting provided by the Worrell Corporation Foundation, based in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, by the Edward H. and Jeannie Arnold Foundation, and by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Behind the Headlines is also supported as a public service by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Visit pahighwayinfo.org. Hi, welcome back to the second segment of Behind the Headlines. On this segment of Behind the Headlines, Mar and are joined by one of the state's leading political commentators and political pundits, Charlie Giroux, who is the CEO of Quantum Communications. Welcome back to the show, Charlie. Great to be back, Charlie. They still allow me to sneak into Quantum Communications every once in a while. So <laughs> oh, I bet, they do. I bet they do. <laughs> Well, we wanted, uh, Maura and I were hoping that uh, we could get one of the state's finest political minds to uh, talk with us about the upcoming elections. I guess we'll start out with the uh, presidential uh, sweepstakes. Um, where are we in Pennsylvania in the presidential race? Um, well, keep saying such nice things about me, Charlie, and I'll say whatever you'd like about whatever <laughs> you'd like. Now, I, it's, it's going to be a fascinating fall, as we all know. The 
nominees are pretty well set at this point, although I'm one that continues to believe that Joe Biden may not actually be the Democrat nominee when it's all said and done, but I'm ready to be proven wrong on that as I am on so many things, Mara. We can talk a little bit more about that. But (laughs) Pennsylvania will be at the apex of the campaign this fall. It's going to be the most significant state that's quote-unquote in play, the most number of electoral votes, coupled with the fact that we're going to have a very, very hotly contested (coughs) race for the U.S. Senate, We're going to be in the eyes of the nation. And I think that when it's all said and done, Donald Trump will win Pennsylvania and will win the presidency. I'm reading that uh, the Republicans are converting more people to the Republican Party than the Democrats are at a faster race this time. They are, Mara, and they have been for some time. They've really dramatically reduced the gap between Republicans and Democrats in this state, according to registration. Now, People haven't voted the registration straight party for quite some time, but Republicans have made real inroads. But where Republicans are really doing well is in three separate demographic categories. The one, which is really interesting to see across the nation, the transformation, Charlie and Mara, of how we view the two parties. It used to be that the Republican Party was the party of the elites and the rich and all this and that stuff, according to what the teachers in school would like us to know. Today, it's the Democrats, the elite moneyed, Mm -hmm. quote-unquote, well-educated Hollywood Hollywood types are Democrats. And you look at the suburban rim around Philadelphia, that's where the Democrats have their edge in very wealthy, highly educated folks, whereas Republicans... Which used to be the base of the Republican Party. Used to be the base of the Republican Party. Now the Republican Party has shifted both geographically south and west, but demographically into much more working-class, you know, regular folk category. And as Lincoln said, God loved the regular people because he made so many of them. Well, we talked recently uh, with an, a, a, another political pundit about the Latino vote in Pennsylvania and how signif- what a significant uh, role they're going to play. Well, that's where I was coming to. That was yeah. the one was, you know, just the, the, the broad demographic. But the other two are both the Latinos, and I am one, as you know, uh, and two, the African-American community, right. where there are huge gains being made by Trump in particular, but by the Republicans kind of following in tow as African-Americans continue to see that they've been taken for granted by the Democrats for many, many years and that the policies of the Biden administration are working against them on the economy. If you ask particularly younger uh, black voters what they think about national politics, they'll say the economy is the number one issue. But right behind that is, of course, the border crisis, and that's hurting African Americans in the cities in particular, both in terms of their physical safety and in terms of their economic well-being. Well, Charlie, let's turn from the presidential race to uh, the U.S. Senate race here in uh, Pennsylvania. Of course, we have Bob Casey uh, going up against um, uh, Mr. McCormick, and uh, Mr. McCormick has just issued a whole series of new ads. Uh There's the ad of him standing in front of West Point, and uh, there's the ad of him uh, wrestling uh, as a younger man. And uh, these were fresher and more hard-hitting ads, I think, than appeared during his earlier uh, campaign against um, against Dr. Oz. I don't know. Um, what has uh, he done to change his approach and his candidacy this time, Charlie? Well, he's the Republican nominee, and it's a very different type of campaign that you run when you're the Republican yeah. nominee as opposed to one you're running to get the nomination. I think Dave McCormick is going to win. I think he may even win convincingly, and I think he's got a very, very bright future ahead of him. Look, Bob Casey got the job, let's be candid, because he was his father's son. And what has he done with it over the course of the past 18 years? What's the signature piece of legislation that Bob Casey has introduced and gotten through the United States Congress, even when it was controlled overwhelmingly by Democrats? Well, there isn't one. But more important, and I think the question that the McCormick campaign needs to ask over and over again, is simply, what has Bob Casey done for you? Because the fact of the matter is, he hasn't done very much. He's a nice man. He's an honest man. You can't attack him on those types of issues, but you can attack him on his effectiveness in public office. He's been in public office basically all his life, over three decades, and has very, very little to show for it. Can we, I I have a sort of an odd question for you, but um, I've been really tracking a lot of what John Fetterman has been doing. And he's really been breaking ranks lately. 
uh, with his party and seems to be, I think he had previously been viewed as a progressive. I think he's coming more towards center. What do you, what do you think about what's going on there? Well, John Fetterman's an interesting person and a fascinating character in his own right. And politically what's happening does not surprise me, by the way. Okay. Uh, you know, John dances to his own tune, takes his own counsel. Sadly, he had a stroke and for a serious amount of time wasn't fully himself. And I think some others stepped into that breach and were maybe making pronouncements that weren't a thousand percent his. Mm -hmm. Now that you're hearing his voice, you're hearing somebody that cares deeply about Israel, wants Israel to be able to destroy Hamas, that puts him at odds with the progressive left mm -hmm. in this country and with a significant number of Democrats. He's actually not anti-fossil fuel. He has a very moderate view on the use of fossil fuels. We've known that for a long time because he's spoken at quantum policy briefings a couple of times. And people look at him saying, wait a minute, did John just say what I thought he said? And the answer is yes. He's, he's, he's not anti-natural gas. He's actually pro-natural gas, wants the safe and responsible development of it. But he's, he's, he's got a very, very good view on that. And some other things that he's broken from the squad and some of these other mm -hmm. folks on and has positioned himself uh, uniquely in his own right, much more like Joe Manchin than like Chuck Schumer. Well, and he's got to be relieved that the headlines are now about his policies and his positions and not no longer about his health. Yeah, I, it's a, that's a good shift for him. It is. Know, and I mean, all of us prayed for a long time for his full recovery. Yeah. And I don't know that he's fully recovered yet, but he's making progress. Right. Yeah. right. Charlie, going back to the uh, Casey and McCormick race for a second, there's some strange dynamics there, I think, uh, because here you had, as you said, uh, Bob Casey uh, has his political career because of his father, and his father yet was one of the great champions of the right to life. And yet, as soon as um, his son goes to Washington, he changed his position on right to life. And I just can't believe that his father wouldn't be um, uh, anguished about that particular change. When you look at that issue and then you look at what role will abortion play in uh, Pennsylvania in this upcoming presidential and senatorial race? It's really tragic that Bob Casey has chosen to do what he's done on the issue of human life. He will still tell folks that he's quote unquote pro-life, but there's nothing in his voting record or in his public statements that would support that. And it's really sad when you look back to his father being disinvited to speak at the National mm -hmm. Convention because of his position on human life. Um, I hate to say, you know, what parents would think about their children. I, I, I think you'd get into dangerous territory there. But I think a lot of us are saddened by Bob Casey's unwillingness to stand up for something he knows is right. Well, I think it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a, a pretty big issue across the board, not just um, on the federal federal side. But, right. you know, it's going to be more and more. And I think that it was kind of underestimated how big of an issue it was in the previous election. So well, and Republicans keep, keep need an to stand it. up for the legitimate position that they hold. They've allowed the Democrats to define them in ways that simply aren't true. That's and Republicans correct. have to say that what the progressive left wants is the right to have an abortion at any time, mm -hmm. right up until the moment of birth and maybe even afterwards, for any reason paid for by the taxpayers. That is not a majority position in this country by a long shot. About 80% of the American people, some polls say 85%, oppose that view. But that's the true view of many on the progressive left these days. Some people, uh, when they look at the uh, upcoming election, there were many concerns that the Republicans at the national level and many at the state level uh, don't have the ground game to compete with the Democrats. And, of course, there was now a change at the Republican National Committee, and uh, the new folks say that their ground game is going to be better and will be the equal of the uh, Democrats. What do you see here in Pennsylvania, Charlie, particularly in that uh, southeastern part of the state, Buxton, uh, Chester, and Montgomery uh, counties? Um, is the Republican ground game going to be better? I think selection? we're going to need to see a lot more, Charlie, and time is going to tell. It's easy to say the ground game is going to be better, but you've yeah. got to prove it every single day. 
campaigns are won every single day. They're not won in the last 72 hours or the last two weeks, or particularly now with early voting in the last month or so. So the Republicans absolutely have to pick up their game. I honestly don't know how much of that has been accomplished at this point. I hear a lot of talk. I haven't yet seen the particulars that would define that for me, but they may be there. But they're going to have to do that consistently and effectively over the course of the next couple of months. So what other, what other races are you finding intriguing? Well, there's an intriguing primary on both sides for Attorney General. And Attorney okay. General obviously is a very, very important office in Pennsylvania. A large number of Democrats running, most of them from the southeast. Eugene D. Pasquale, whom you know, running from the west. So he may have an advantage geopolitically. Plus he has a base in central Pennsylvania from his days uh, both in the legislature and as uh, Auditor General. Uh, but that race is up for grabs. And on the Republican side, you have a hotly contested primary with Dave Sunday from York County against Craig Williams, state representative from Delaware County, who's raging a very effective campaign uh, at this point, despite the fact that he doesn't have the party endorsement. He's kind of running as the outsider, saying that the powers that be and the establishment are not what represent most Republicans in Pennsylvania. He's gone after Dave Sunday on being weak on crime, and we'll have to see how all of that turns out. Mm -hmm. So what do you think the, uh, the uh, balance of power will be for the congressional delegation when it's all said and done, Charlie, in our last I, I think minute? that Republicans will control the House in Washington, but by a very, very slim margin again. But I think in Pennsylvania, the balance will be to the Republicans, whereas right now it's not. Okay. Oh. His last crystal ball. He has his crystal ball. Last question for you. <laughs> oh, though. my gosh. Um, let's see. Anything with the Auditor General's, uh, what's going on with the Auditor General, any? Well, again, the Republicans have the incumbent, Tim right. DeFore. Uh, He's very popular. Very popular, first African-American to hold that job, a Republican, interestingly. Yeah. Uh, the Democrats, Lord only knows who they're going to come up with, but the candidate that appears to be emerging hasn't ever done anything other than audit his own checkbook, has absolutely <laughs> no experience no qualifications, no credentials, is an ultra-liberal Democrat from Philadelphia. It'll be very interesting to see how that plays out in November. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, you've heard it here first from Charlie Giroux, and we appreciate your appearance here with us, Charlie. Great to be with both of you. Well, thank you very much, and we'll see you next week again on another episode of Behind the Headlines. Tune in then.